Excellent. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Um, we are very excited to have you all here. This is the Upgrade webinar, What's New for 1911. I'm Donna Pachowski, and I'm one of the educators um, by, here at Bywater, and I have the amazing Andrew with me. <laughs> um, no, Jane, I'm going to have to write that one down. Queen's Thief Series. Okay. Um, you know, Readish Advisory is always an important part of what we do. So I love getting these tips and, and all of that sort of stuff. So um, we are doing something a little bit different today, or, or this time with our, um, with our upgrade information. Instead of doing the long series of webinars, um, taking a, um, you know, a different approach to it and trying to really kind of be respectful of your time. We are doing these What's New webinars, which are about an hour in length. They are recorded and posted. We've done, this is our second one. They're both the same. Um, so the same information is, is covered in those. And then what we've done is we've done a lot more extensive blog posts with all of the other things that are in technical services and that are in, um, you know, circulation and all of that sort of stuff. So we've got a lot of other information out there for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen and just kind of show you where you can find some of this information. Um, as we're getting started, uh, I see Lori's got her hand up in the, the Zoom participants. Um, Lori, feel free to go ahead and put a question in the chat or the, the Q&A. Um, I don't know if you raised your hand intentionally or definitely happens on some misclicks too, so no worries if that's the case. Um, so here on our Bywater website, we have this link here that I will go ahead and put in panel some attendees. There we go. Um, this is our upgrade notes. And so this just goes ahead and tells you all of the information that's available out here. So we have all of the release notes, the manual, the schema. Here are some of our tutorial videos and blogs for the enhancements that are in 1911. And then these are our, what I was talking about, the module specific blog posts. So for each of these, what we've done is gone through and pulled out the things that y'all need to know about um, and have put those all into one blog post. Um, those things are not being covered in this What's New webinar, so it's additional information. Um, yeah, Lori, Q&A is fine, don't worry about that, that's perfect, yeah. Um, so this is all the additional information that you might want to go ahead and take a look at. So these are things you need to be aware of that the what's new though is kind of like what we call our top 10. Um, everything else is going to be in these module specific blog posts. So you're definitely going to want to go ahead and take a look at those. On this same web page, we have the link from uh, Tuesday's what's new webinar. So you can watch that one also. And then here's a list of all the other things that are included in the 1911 release. Now we have another page, not to be confused, which is our 1911 upgrade webinars. So this is where you came to register for today's. The thing that I want you to be aware of is that what we're gonna be doing next in about two weeks is we're gonna be doing some Q and A sessions. So the idea is you'll watch the What's New webinars, you'll go ahead and look at our blog posts, you'll go to our demo site, play on 1911, kind of works through some, through some, some things. And then um, in two weeks, come back to our Q&A session where we'll go ahead and answer any questions or, hey, how does this work? Those sorts of things. Um, so those links are on the page also to register. So that's June 2nd at 3 p.m. and then June 4th at 11 a.m. So again, the Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday afternoon, Thursday morning sort of thing. And then if you ha don't have it yet, the agenda on what we're covering um, during this uh, What's New session is on that page also. Um, so. We're, we're trying this to see how it works. Um, as always, we want to make sure that you are um, satisfied with what we're doing and that you're getting the information that you want out of this. So we will be doing some follow-ups with, um, you know, surveys and things like that. So if you do get those surveys, if you would, please make sure you fill them out and let us know if this education process is a little bit better for you, um, what you think of it, those sorts of things, because we're here for you to make this process as easy as possible. Now, I know one of the first questions we're going to get asked is when are upgrades happening? And upgrades to 1911 are going to start the week of June 7th. So we've got a couple of weeks still. Um, there's some really exciting stuff in 1911. So calling Andrew out, what's your number one favorite thing in 1911? It's not um, the most like functional or important thing, but I'm really excited about musical insipids on the OPAC. Yes. So this is a cool thing I learned about. Apparently in the Mark 031 field, you can record a, a weirdly encoded snippet of sheet music. And now Koha will show you that sheet music and play it on a little MIDI player. 
So that is really neat. Um, I went down a rabbit hole yesterday when Andrew was sharing some of the resources. <laughs> um, might have spent a little too much time trying to figure that out. Um, but there's some really cool stuff. And if we get through fast enough, um, we'll go ahead and show you that one too. But we did go ahead and put the last one um, uh, in the recording from Tuesday, we were able to show that at the end. So if we don't get to it today, just skip to like the last five minutes of yesterday's recording, or excuse me, Tuesday's recording, and you'll be able to see that in there. So there's some really cool stuff. So. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump straight in. So 1911, uh, patron clubs. There is a new functionality that was sponsored by the Southeast Kansas Library System where you can add a club holds feature. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to place a hold for all of the members of your club. This is really great when you have those book groups or things like that, that everyone needs a copy of the book, um, but you don't wanna to have to go through and manually place 15 holds for everyone. You can do it all at once. So a couple of ways that we're gonna go ahead and do this. I'm gonna go ahead and head over to my tools section, which is where our patron clubs are. Remember that patron clubs are a newer functionality. Um, it's only been around for a couple of releases and their continu Koha is continuing to develop these as we go. So that's really exciting um, to see that this functionality is being developed. So in our patron club section, I have our introvert book club. Um, and what you can go ahead and do is under the actions. So there's two ways to do it. This is the first way, go to your clubs and go to search to hold, okay. Then you're gonna go ahead and be able to search for the item that you're looking for. Okay. So we've got our item here. When I go ahead and place my hold, I can do it from my clubs here. Um, or I can go ahead and just come straight to this item and do it. So you can do it either way. Um, so this one I'm going to go ahead and this is called the introvert. Okay, so here we have our information about our clubs. Um, pick up branches at the East Branch. Right now, um, it's, you have to tell it which branch we picked up at. So hopefully all of the members are coming to the same location. You can see the members of your club to see who all is getting the holds placed on it. And then I just go ahead and place hold. Okay, so now all four of those patrons are on hold. And you may notice that they were not placed in the same order that they were on the list. Um, Koha goes ahead and randomizes this. So really kind of a neat thing um, that, you know, Madge is not always gonna be the first person to get the book. It's gonna be switched up every time that you, um, ask for a hold for one of your clubs. So a neat little functionality um, that's really gonna make things a lot better. Um, I know that some libraries have talked about using it for like a bestseller club. Um, so if there's like a Patterson bestseller club, um, you could go ahead and just set up a club for that, let people enroll in it. And then every time the new Patterson comes out, which is what every other week, you would just be able to go ahead and add that hold for that entire club so your patrons won't have to do it individually. So kind of a nice function. Definitely think about how you can use those patron clubs. Andrew shared a blog um, with some club information in there. There's a link in that blog post um, about how to set up clubs, but really a fun functionality and I love seeing it used in, in interesting ways. So go ahead and give it a shot, um, but I think you're, you're gonna find those clubs kind of cool to be able to do that, okay? So again, my other option, so that way I started from the clubs. This way I could just search the catalog directly. And again, place my hold. Click on my clubs tab. Um, Lori asked in the Q&A how to create a club. Um, because Lori, you mentioned Previously, that the chat window wasn't working for you, I put that same blog post link in the Q&A as well. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and so like you can see for the second item that we went ahead and post, that we placed a hold on, Rachel was first. Um, so again, it goes ahead and swaps up the order of those. Um, so again, kind of put your, put your brain to work and see there's some fun ways that you can go ahead and work on this. Um, and again, this was sponsored by the Southeast Kansas Library System, so thanks to them for sponsoring this development. Okay. On to something that I think everyone is going to be excited about. I know that I get asked about this at every single training that I do, Andrew, I'm sure you do too, um, which is claims return. 
So there is a new functionality in 1911, um, which is claims returned. This has been sponsored by the Fargo Public Library, hi Fargo, and the North Central Regional Library System, um, hi North Central NCRL. Um, we appreciate y'all sponsoring this one. This is really, really exciting. So there are three new system preferences that go along with claims returned, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and just in my sysprefs, search for claims, so we can go ahead and take a look at those, those system preferences. So here's our three system preferences. Claim return charge fee, claim return lost value, and claim return warning threshold. So basically what each of these does, so the claim return charge fee, when marking a checkout as a claims returned, ask if the lost fee should be charged to the patron, automatically charge the lost fee, or automatically do not charge the lost fee. This is important because the, the main thing to remember about claims return is it's actually a lost functionality. It's part of that lost um, setup in Koha. Um, so it's gonna go ahead and behave the same way that your lost materials do. So um, depending on how that works, um, you would need to go ahead and make sure that your settings are, are behaving properly. So um, I would say always with, 19, with anything that we do new, go ahead and set up a test example, make sure it's behaving the way that you want it in your system. But this, um, this system preference asks whether or not a lost fee should be charged or automatically assesses one or doesn't. So we've got our set to ask if a fee should be charged. Uh, Donna, before we dive further into claims return, we have a, one more question about club holds. Uh, Kelly asked, how does the list of club holds merge with other patron holds, thinking of order of holds? Um, once those holds are made, they're not different from other holds, they're just in that hold list, and they'll, your club holds will put themselves at the end of any existing hold list. So it's just sort of like, it, it's the same as if you had taken every patron in that club and manually made a hold for each one of them. Yeah, it doesn't give them priority. It doesn't bump them to the top or anything like that. It just kind of plops them at that point in the list. Um, so yeah, good question. Um, claim return lost value. So with this new functionality, you have the ability to go ahead and designate a lost authorized value. We were playing around in here. Um, you can't use two of them. You can only use one. Um, but we've designated an authorized value for lost as five that will represent claims return. So that way I can go ahead and separate those claims return um, in my lost reports from everything else. And then claim return warning threshold. This will basically let staff know when a patron has exceeded a certain number of claims. It does not block the account, but it puts a note on the patron's account that says they've exceeded X number of claims returned. So you can just immediately see um, if this is potentially someone that you need to have a, a deeper conversation with. We've got our set at one, so we can go ahead and see it very quickly. Most of y'all will probably have a set a little bit higher for that. So those are the three new system preferences for claims return. I'm gonna go ahead and save our updates. Okay, so let's see how this works. I'm gonna go ahead and find a patron. So Louise Belcher, okay. What you're gonna see now is down under their summary, okay? We have the checkouts, and then we also have the claims return tab here, okay? On this claims return tab, you'll go ahead and see all of that information that's gonna be showing up there, all right? What the process is gonna be, you come into checkouts, and then over on the right-hand side, there's a new column here. So we've got our renew, our check-in, and now we have a return claims. I can go ahead and mark this item as a claim return. I click on that. I can go ahead and put the notes in here. So I could say patron as they gave it to Andrew. Okay. And then notice because of my system preference where it asks me whether or not I want to charge that lost fee or not, I can either click the checkbox to charge that lost fee or not. If you have that system preference set to one of those other two, where it's either automatically charging or not automatically charging, you won't have this option. But we're not gonna charge her right now because I need to go talk to Andrew and see what's going on. But I'm gonna go ahead and make that claim. Okay, so now you'll notice on my claims tab, instead of before where it said zero, zero, it now shows zero, one. The item has not been returned from their account yet. 
And I can now see that we have this, the book with the links to it, the note that I can edit if I needed to, um, and then everything else that's in here. So the next step would be, we've got some, you know, under actions, I can either go ahead and edit my notes. Um, and so perhaps I come in here and say something like um, check shelves, uh, what's today, 521, 20. Um, so you could use that to go ahead and keep track of how often you've looked for it, stuff like that. Or I can go ahead and resolve this. Okay, so the resolution, um, it was either found in the library or it was returned by patron. However, remember the one thing that we emphasize when we're doing trainings for drop down menus mean they are an authorized value. Yes, authorized uh, value. I want to realize I was the only one with a microphone there. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so, authorized values means you can control what's in these drop downs. Um, so, you can go ahead and change that to whatever you want those to be. So, if you want, want to have found in library, returned by patron, um, magically appeared, no one knows how, um, or, you know, checked shelves five times, closing this, whatever, whatever your process is. It's an authorized value, so you have the ability to go ahead and add um, different things here. But we're going to go ahead and say that this one was actually found in the library. It was our bad, because Andrew didn't check it in like he was supposed to. I'm going to go ahead and resolve the claim. Okay. And so now you'll see that this has changed from zero slash one to one slash zero. We're having some conversations right now because this is a little bit confusing, um, but it's how many resolved claims versus how many active claims right now, okay? <laughs> um, so here we can go ahead and say that this was found in the library. You can see the staff member that went ahead and made that note when it was updated, all of those sorts of things. Now, I do want to point out that this item is still checked out to that patron. So you will want to go ahead and check that in, which you probably should have done originally. Um, but actually, you know what? I want to go ahead and look at this in the, or in the catalog so you can see. Um, so you can see right here that that does show as a lost status that it is claims returned. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and check this in. Okay. So we have a lot going on in our test site, as you can tell. Um, but you can, the big one is that that not for loan status was updated. Um, so I'm going to hit okay. And now when we look at this, we're still not going to be able to really kind of see it because it's not for loan for quarantine, but it's no longer checked out to that patron. And when I go ahead and look at Louise's account, okay, you will see, again, that, is, that does stay there even though we've checked that in and there's no more checkouts for her. Um, so how does that show for patrons? Let's go ahead and um, let's look at Rachel. Let me go ahead. I don't think she has anything checked out right now. No. So I'm going to go ahead and check out to her. So we are going to go ahead. Uh, well, Don is checking that out. Uh, Fatima asked, can one have access to the presentation recording? Uh, yeah, the recording will be up on our blog and our YouTube channel. Um, once this is done, um, we'll probably have it up by the end of the day. And the recording of the previous What's New, which is all the same content, is, is up there already. Uh, she also asked if we're going to issue a certificate of participation. We don't for that. We don't have any sort of uh, continuing education certificate process. That might not be a bad idea. I know we had talked about it at some point. Yeah. Um, so you will see in the OPAC that this item does show claims returned. It shows a lot right now because we've got a, the quarantine on there too, which we haven't cleaned cleared that out, um, but it does show the claims returned. And then I'm going to go ahead and log in to account. Hopefully I set this up right. Here 
There we go. All right. Now we'll rock, log in. Okay. Um, so you'll see in here that that does not show as a claims return on the patron's account yet um, because it's not it's just there. Um, it's not actually lost or anything like that. Um, so as far as the patron knows, that item is just checked out. So it's a reminder to them they need to, they need to be looking at that. But again, it really kind of determines how you have your lost things set up. So if you have it set up that that lost item is supposed to be checked in from the patron's account, they wouldn't see this. So they wouldn't see those notes at all um, with those. But again, you would see it if you looked at the item itself. But for the patron account, they don't actually see that at this point. And that sort of display to, to make that show in the patron account as claims return that was outside the scope of, of the original enhancement. So it doesn't do that now, but, but we're always looking for anytime we put in a new feature. Okay. Now that this base functionality is there, how do we build that out? What else should it do? So yeah, feel free to file bugs or let us know. Yeah, absolutely. I know we're always looking for, for more, to make things all better, so. <laughs> um, Zara asked in the chat uh, if we could demonstrate how to change the options in a drop-down menu. Do you wanna just jump over to authorized values and show those resolution statuses? So authorized values and what is that one actually called, Andrew? Do claims resolution, I don't know. If you oh, type return it, claim up. resolution, there we go. So under authorized values, you're gonna go ahead and do return claim resolutions. Um, and so you can see here that we have the found in lib, ret by patron. I'm gonna go ahead and actually add a new authorized value. And this authorized value is going to be magic. And we're gonna call this one magically reappeared. Um, and then again, remember with authorized values, you can have one description that shows to patrons and one description that shows to staff. So um, since I'm gonna go ahead and just leave this blank, magically reappeared will show for both the OPAC and the staff accounts. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Um, Christopher asked a question in the chat. What will happen if a claimed return is found and checked in later and not resolved through that dialog? Um, checking in a claims return item does not currently automatically resolve that claim, it'll pop up a little message that says this is claimed by so-and-so, by Rachel or Louise or whoever, um, but it is still on staff to resolve that. Um, and it'll link you over to the patron. Uh, I know that is a, an enhancement we're already looking at to add some, add the ability to define if this gets checked in, resolve the status with, with this resolve value. So, Look for that to change. That'll be exciting. Um, and then there are a couple of questions over in the Q and A. Uh, Nadia, Nidia uh, asked: Once the claim return is solved, it stays in the patron record where we as staff are the only ones to see. Yeah. Once this is resolved, you'll still see it in the patron record, but uh, patrons won't see their history of old claims. And that is another thing that we already have written a, a patch to add a, an, a, the ability to clear out resolve claims after a period of time to say like, keep them for a year and then delete them. Yeah. So yeah, right now it stays indefinitely until you delete it, but we're working on folding that into some existing cleanup processes. Actually, I'm thinking that didn't Kelly put me over the limit with my claims returns? No, I guess not. Um, I was gonna say, I, I wanna show you the, the message that's right there. Um, I think I'm over the limit. You are? There we go. So this is an example of when you come in to check out, you will see that attention message right there that the patron has two claims return. Um, and again, we're set at one claim return for our notification. Um, so once they get more than one's claims return, they'll see this message. Um, but that will show based on that system preference. Again, it doesn't block anything. Patrons don't see that. Um, it's purely for staff to see that this patron has two claims return. All right. So 
So claims return, fun functionality, definitely go and play with that um, and take a look at it and see what's there. Um, that's correct, Christopher, that there's no blocks um, with the claims return, with the exception of if I was charging that lost fee, then patrons would be blocked by the dollar amount, whatever yours is set to. Um, but as of right now, it does the, the claims return functionality in itself does not block anything. And Catherine asked what that looks like on the public side. Uh, so the individual item in the public catalog will show that status of claims return, but there's nothing in the patron record on the public side to say this checkout was claimed. Okay. Another, um, so we're going to move on to patrons. Another fun thing that we've had a lot of people ask for, um, this has been sponsored by Northeast Kansas Library System and the Vermont Organization of Koha Automated Libraries, so Neckles and Vocal. Um, say that a few times fast. Um, this was going to allow you to have multiple guarantors to a patron record. Um, so there's a lot to unpack with that one statement. Let's go ahead and bring up uh, one of my patrons. So we're going to bring up Feely. Um, <laughs> one last claims return question, which I mm -hmm. answered in the chat, but to say it aloud, uh, Christopher asked if it's possible to charge the lost fee at resolution of the claim, and it is not. Right now, it's either you charge at the moment it becomes claimed or, or you don't. Okay, well, let me go ahead. I, I must have gotten distracted when I was setting these up. So I'm adding a child to an adult patron. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get that guarantor or that patron in there really quickly. Um, so now what you're going to do is when you have a child account, so this is my child patron, okay, when I am editing their account, we still have that standard guarantor where I can go ahead and add that guarantor information in there. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and look for Flavia. I love that series, Barbara. Okay, so I found her. I'm going to go ahead and select Flavia as the guarantor for Feely's account. So we went ahead and added that. Okay, I do have the ability that I can add to the relationship. Um, I forgot Andrew was playing in here yesterday, so our only relationship available is Super Dude. Um, that's not super. That's the relationship right now. Um, something else I do have the ability though now. I can allow the guarantors of this patron to view the patron's checkouts from the OPAC, yes or no, and I can show the fines, yes or no. Okay. So this is where you, it's a little bit easier to go ahead and control what the patrons can see for the guarantors, guarantees, that sort of thing. So I've added my first guarantor. When I scroll down under contact information, I have a secondary set here of guarantor, surname, first name, and relationship. And this is where it gets really neat. This can be a non-patron. Um, so I could go ahead and add someone who is a patron. It's not going to link to their patron account, um, but I could add a second patron in here or a second person in here. So this is really great for perhaps kids where their parents do not have a library card. You can still now go ahead and add that information in there. So I'm going to go ahead and add... Oh, no, I've got that backwards. So surname first, so that's going to be Dogger. The first name is going to be Mister, and the relationship he definitely is a super dude. So we're going to go ahead and go with that one. Um, so you can go ahead and add that in there. I'm going to go ahead and save that record. Okay, and so now when I look at Feely's details, I will see that I have the guarantor with a hot link to Flavia's account. And I will have the secondary guarantor that again, that one does not have to be a patron. It's not linked, but you do have that information there. Um, Cheryl asked in the Q&A, uh, can you set the default of showing the fines and items as either yes or no, or does it only default to no? And that is always going to, both of those are going to default to no. Um, right. Just to 
prioritize patron privacy, make it something you have to turn on. Yeah. Um, and no, Christopher, at this point, you cannot have two linked guarantors. Um, I imagine that would be something that could be developed. I hate to correct you, Donna, but you can. Did I miss something? You can, have, you can have any number of linked guarantors and then only one unlinked guarantor. Oh my goodness. There we go. Right there. I can do another search to add. Um, we're going to look for Rachel. And Rachel is also a super dude. That relationship drop down is customizable if you don't want all of your patients to be super dudes. I love super dude. Um, so now when I look at Feely's account, ah, oh, we have two linked. That is awesome. I did miss that one. Thank you, Andrew. Sure. Um, be aware if, if y'all have reports that look at guarantors, that data structure has changed to accommodate those multiple guarantors. Um, so your reports will just need to get tweaked. Well, Brittany, why would we want anything other than a super dude? I think super dude might be sexist. Is dude, is dude gender neutral or not? I think that's an ongoing argument. <laughs> um, and then Christopher further asked, uh, the options for viewing fines and checkouts apply to all guarantors. Uh, yeah, that's correct. That's, that's one choice that applies to all guarantors. They're pretty exciting, right? I mean, I think that that is an absolutely fantastic um, ability to be able to go ahead and add those multiple um, guarantors and non-patron guarantors, which I know is something's been asked for for quite a few, for quite a while. So again, very exciting. Give it a shot. Um, let us know how it's working for you. Um, so let's see, in the Midwest, it's non-gendered and in the South, it's gendered. And I think that's what it is, is because for, for me in the South, dude is a guy. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at. So um, I see Mary's question, can two non-patrons be guarantors? No, um, you can only have one non-patron as a guarantor. Right, Dan? I just, I just filed a bug to change that this morning, but I, I don't know that anyone's actively working on it in the 45 minutes it has existed. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, cataloging, one of my favorite sections. But actually, in all seriousness, I love this enhancement. Um, for this one, it is um, limiting your item type by library. This was sponsored by most of Kansas, is kind of the way we joke about it. Um, so Central Kansas Library System, Northeast Kansas Library System, and Southeast Kansas Library System. So Checkles, Neckles, and Seckles um, got together to sponsor this enhancement. Um, now, under your item types, you have the ability to limit item types by branches. So we're accustomed to having that limitation in place when we're doing authorized values and things like that. Now we have that ability that under our um, item types, we have that li library limitation available. So for instance, if perhaps artwork is something that is only available at one particular library, you have that library limitation functionality available so that no one else will be able to see that when they are doing things such as adding materials and, and whatnot. Um, so that's a really nice enhancement. We appreciate uh, Kansas basically sponsoring that one. Um, but for instance, again, with like games, you can see here that we only have two libraries that are using games. So those are the only two branches that will go ahead and see those. And that is done just through the standard way that we do all of our other library limitations is you have your library limitations box. It would either default to all libraries or you could go ahead and pick and choose which locations are going to have that. So I'm going to say that east, north, and south have this available to them. I go ahead and save that. Those are the only three libraries that are going to be able to kind of choose that when you do have that item type limitation. So Fantastic, fantastic um, enhancement. I know we don't spend much time on this one, but it's just, uh, it's huge. So we're, we're very, very excited about this one. So that is the limit your item types by library. Um, so any of y'all that are multi-library um, consortiums, I know are absolutely gonna adore that one. Okay. 
Next up, cereals. So we often joke that cereals is, is the unloved section of Koha. Um, it tends not to get a lot of attention. Um, a lot of libraries don't use this. Um, I know uh, public libraries in particular don't tend to use cereals, but I am on a quest um, to help make cereals the best it can be so that more libraries use this. Um, so we're gonna be keep working on that and figuring out how to make cereals as easy as possible for libraries to be able to use this. This enhancement um, is one that I know law libraries in particular are gonna absolutely love. Um, and what you can do is you can add multiple copies of an item when you are receiving. So for instance, if you get you get five copies of something. In the past, what you wound up doing was having five separate subscriptions for that, and you would have to receive each one individually. Now, you can go ahead and have one subscription and add multiple copies of it when you get that. So, to come into Serials, we're gonna go ahead and look for the magazine that just showed up on my desk to check in. So here we go. <laughs> I love Kelly and Christopher's comments. I just, I, this is actually really kind of cool. Um, so I found the serial subscription that we, that we're getting, which is Bird Watchers Digest. Now you do have to have it set up so that serial receipt creates an item record. So that is one caveat with this. Um, it does have to create an item record when you receive it. So make sure that your serial is set to that. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and just receive. Okay, we can see that issue number five, I'm gonna go ahead and click on arrived. I get my item information where I would go ahead and just make any changes that I needed to in here. I'm not changing anything. We do have barcode turned automatically on. Um, and that's something that I would have, I would, if y'all are interested in doing this and looking in the, into the specifics of it, um, this would be something that, feel free to open a ticket and we can kind of talk through the process of this one. Um, so, but for this, I would say go ahead and have that barcode turned on automatically. And then right down here, the number of copies to be made of this item. And we're going to go ahead and say we've gotten four of those. And this is where it comes into why it's important with these barcodes. The barcode you enter will be incremented for each additional item. Um, so there needs to be some conversations about that. If you're using pre-printed barcodes, this may not work for you the way that you expect it to. So again, if it's something you want some work, uh, some help with on the workflows, let us know and we're more than happy to work through that. So just open a ticket for us. Okay. Um, speaking of, Catherine asked in the chat if there is an overview blog post about serials. She's interested but would need some basics. There really isn't. Um, serials is sort of a, a big enough beast with enough moving parts that nobody's, nobody's wanted to tackle that blog post. Uh, but that said, we'd be more than happy to, to schedule a webinar and, and walk through it with you. Absolutely. Um, and that is on my to-do list is, is creating that serials one. Really from the perspective perspective of how to make serials as easy as possible. So, um, okay. I selected four. I'm going to kind of click on save. Uh, Purvez asks, in cataloging only item type limits is upgraded or any other things? There are definitely other things changed and improved in cataloging. That's the only one we pulled out for this very broad overview. Um, but if you go back to the, the blog post that Donna linked originally, the upgrade notes, that links off to our module specific blog posts and the technical services one has a bunch of, uh, yeah. And we also did a Monday Minutes a couple of weeks ago on two of the other really exciting changes in cataloging um, using the advanced editor. So if you haven't seen that one either, even me as a non-cataloger was excited about the changes. They were just really kind of cool. Um, so yeah, but definitely take a look at these blog posts. Um, again, what's in here is, typic is not what we're covering in the what's new. Um, so you definitely need to go ahead and take a look at these. This is where all the rest of the changes are. The what's new is just kind of the big ones that everyone needs to know about. Okay, so now that I have received that item, I'm gonna go ahead and look at my bib, because remember I received four copies of that. When I look at my Biblio, look at that, isn't that wonderful? 
it went ahead and added all four copies of that with the barcodes, with the received date, all of that information. Um, so that's going to be really fantastic um, to have that available um, for libraries that are receiving multiple copies and things like that. So again, a little bit of workflow that you may have to work through, um, but we'll go ahead and take a look at that and see how that works for you. Um, uh, Kelly asked if, we, if you can do multiple issues without a barcode. Uh, and yeah, you can just make those with no barcode and then just go in and add them in if you need to circulate those. Yes, yeah. Um, and Zara asked about call number search and whether or not that will be fixed when the upgrade is pushed. And yes, I'm looking at that bug now. It did get backported. Yeah. Um, so that is in 1911. It's also in 1905, but just sort of where that fix landed that hasn't gotten out to anybody yet. Okay, so the next section, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Andrew um, because these are changes that we really can't show you too much, um, but they are really important changes that y'all need to be aware of. And this is on the account lines. So yeah, um, this is maybe, this is less an exciting feature and more a point of awareness. So that last section of the, the what's new agenda, if you're looking at it, lumps a whole bunch of bugs together. Um, the Koha community has been doing some ongoing work to really improve account lines data structure. We saw a little bit of that in the 1905 upgrade, more of the same in 1911, really changing a lot of stuff there in great ways, but ways that will break existing reports. Um, the main thrust of these changes, previously account lines had one column for account type that had a bunch of uh, alphabet or yeah, letter codes to label, is this a fine, is it a lost fee, is it a credit, is it a payment? Um, if you've spent any time with that data, you've probably seen those codes and been frustrated by them. Um, it was kind of a weird mishmash. So in 1911, we're taking that account type and actually splitting it into two new columns, one for a credit ID and one for, for a credit type rather, and one for a debit type. And in the process of doing that, sorry, my cat is jumping on my keyboard. In the process of doing that, we're changing all of those codes to make them something actually just human readable rather than a, a single letter. So they'll say, overdue or lost instead of F or L. So that's really cool. It's gonna make reports a lot easier to write going forward. It makes it really easy to separate credits from debits or to see what type of thing they are. But it means the reports are gonna to have to get rewritten. I think that should get pretty rote as we go through it. They're not very complicated changes. Um, look at the reports you use that that hit account lines or look at patron fines and fees. If you want to tease through that SQL yourself and figure that out, by all means do so, but also feel free to open tickets with us to, to ask us to look at anything you need. And I did, I should grab my blog post. I wrote a blog post about what those changes are. Um, that if you're trying to look at your existing reports and, and work through them, we'll give you a good sense of how to do that. Okay. So while Andrew is finding that, I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Um, Andrew, what, um, what bib has the music on it? Do you remember? Uh, 30013. Yeah, I looked for that and it's not in there. Really? 30013, because that's what I was thinking yesterday. It was. Oh, it doesn't show here. It only shows on the OPEC. Oh, it's changed. Why is that not showing right? That's a fair. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Just take a second. Okay. Got it up on my screen. 
<laughs> it's like, I just wasn't patient enough. Um, so here we go. So on this particular item, so this is one of the enhanced ones um, that we're talking about. Um, on this item, you can go ahead and see that there is the musical notation and you have the ability to go ahead and play the sample. So that's a lot of potential in there with this um, upgrade. I'm thinking any library that has sheet music. Um, we had one of our partners in yesterday that has the collection. <laughs> yeah, Mary, I thought you might pick up on that one. <laughs> um, that's Hedwig's theme. Um, for um, any of the, we had the library yesterday that has um, sea chanties in their collection. Um, so that would be a great way to be able to put those in there too. So a lot of really fun things that you can do with this. I don't understand the technicalities of it. It is done through the 031. Absolutely. I can show you the mark record for this one. It's um, kind of amazing. It's my favorite thing I've learned about mark this year, which is a weird category that didn't used to exist in my life. So 031, that's what it looks like. So that's where that all runs out of is the 031 field. Um, so really a, a very cool functionality um, in that to be able to have that in there. So again, one of those things that I'm looking forward to seeing how y'all use that one. Let us know. Um, we love to, to you know, pass the word about what y'all are doing interesting. And so this has some, some great functionalities in that one. Um, so Joshua asks, who typed that one in? How did you get that in there, Andrew? Um, I found a website. Let me, where did that go? This is actually, I believe, this website is the same, same folks that uh, wrote the code that we're using to make that render. Um, but I just put it into the chat. It's a, so the, Notation there is called plain and easy. Um, and it, yeah, it's a way to notate sheet music. The website I, I linked in the chat is a plain and easy generator. It gives you like a funny little keyboard to click keys as if you were playing a, a piano and it renders that into notation. Um, so Jane's idea about using an URL to an audio file. Um, so not quite with this, but you still could do that. You could have a link in here um, that could link patrons out to um, an audio file for a review or something like that. So that functionality is still is there. Not quite with this, um, but there are ways to do that. So yeah. Um, I want to show off my favorite part in um, 1911 which is there's a new button here in the OPAC called send to device. And what this does is it goes ahead and generates a QR code. So you can go ahead and just take a snapshot of that QR code and it's going to go ahead and push this record link to your phone. So you'll have that available to you later. Um, so to me, that's just a really kind of a, a neat functionality that I don't have to kind of keep a list written down pen and paper of all of these sorts of things and stuff like that. I can take a snapshot of that QR code. It's going to save that information on my phone for me. Oh, excellent. Christopher said he suggested that. I love it. Um, it it's really going to be absolutely fantastic um, that you can go ahead and just take snapshots of these QR codes and have those links available to you when you're actually in the library or or whatever you're doing with that one. So I think that's a really a really cool functionality. Um, and I look forward to seeing that being used again. Um, I know QR codes have kind of had this up and down over the last decade or so. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that CDs are coming back again. Um, they're really kind of handy to be able to use. So, um, so those are kind of some of our features. Again, the really important thing, we cannot stress this enough, is make sure you come to the upgrades sections of the website and take a look at these specific blog posts on the, the more enhanced um, updates in here. There's a lot that is being done in there. But again, we felt that this top, this what's new is really kind of those big ones that you need to know about. Um, the really kind of the, the big shiny things that are either going to do something new with your workflow or break stuff in your existing workflow. Um, so we want to make sure that y'all are aware of those. But you, it's really important that you do take a look at these other blogs um, for the technical services, which is cataloging and serials, um, admin reports, pretty self-explanatory, OPAC and public services, 
and then patients and circulation. So take a look at those. We've got the bugs listed. We've got descriptions for a lot of those. We have videos, screenshots, things like that. Um, and then again, in two weeks, we'll have our Q&A. So now that you've attended this one, you're going to play with all of these things. And then you're going to go ahead and come to our Q&A and ask any questions that you might have. Now, if you want to play with um, 1911, it's not on your site yet, come to the Bywater website. And then just as we come down, just from the home page, scroll down, and we have the staff client demo, username and password, and then the OPAC demo, username and password. Um, this is on 1911, so you'll be able to go ahead and do all of these things that we talked about in here. So go in there and explore, have fun. Remember that this does get refreshed every three hours. Um, so make sure that you don't expect to come back three days later and have that same information in there. Um, this is really more of a kind of uh, interactive, you know, do it now sort of thing and play with that one. So, um, but definitely take a look and, and give it a shot. See what's going on with that one. Um, is 1911 on the sandbox or are they master? They're master. Master, yeah, like the sandboxes are masters. So, um, but yeah, go ahead and take a look. So that's all that we have for y'all. Thank you all for joining us so much. We'll go ahead and process all of these questions that we got today. We'll add them to another document of the questions that we got on Tuesday. We'll add that to our upgrade um, notes so you can see all the questions that have been asked in either one of those. We'll also go ahead and add a link to this recording on that same site. So definitely take a look. Um, as always, when you're our partners, we look forward to hearing from you about all these exciting things that you're doing. So make sure you share the word. Andrew, any last words of wisdom? No. <laughs> no wisdom. Oh, you have lots of wisdom. <laughs> but thank you all for joining uh -huh. us. Hope you have an awesome day.